cut out for us. Three verses, but quite a lot to talk about this morning. <clears throat> First Timothy 1, 18 through 20. All right, well, let me read our text this morning, and then we will get started. <clears throat> so this is verse 18 of chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. Paul says, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, <clears throat> that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hamanius uh, and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now let's pray. Father, we ask for your help in this time. Lord, may I not speak from my opinions or anything of that sort. May we simply sit under your word and be blessed by it. Lord, thank you for Jesus Christ, in whom all of our hope is vested in. And Father, again, we, we just pray for our children this morning. Uh, God, we pray uh, that the world would not have influence over them, nor Satan, nor their own desires, but Lord, that you would deliver them from them all in Christ Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to uh, just thank, Matt is not here, <laughs> but over the interwebs, uh, if, he's, if he watches this recording, uh, but I, I thanked him already, but uh, big thanks to Matt uh, for preaching for me last week while my wife and I were uh, gallivanting in Mississippi. <clears throat> um, we had a great time. Our kids got spoiled by grandparents, so a good time was had by all. <laughs> Um, but also big thanks to Pat and Carol Ann for uh, leading in worship last week, and they are on vacation as well uh, this week. Um, so with that said, um, distraction can be a very dangerous thing. Whether it's having your eyes glued to your phone while you're driving or seeing someone else who is doing that, or you're ignoring dangerous health symptoms because you're really busy at that point in your life, being distracted from what's really important can have disastrous results. And the same thing is true for the Christian life. In the church, if you let something distract you, or in your life distract you from the gospel, from the beautiful reality of Jesus paying, for your sins and delivering you from Satan's domain and placing you in Christ's kingdom. If you allow yourself to become distracted from those realities, disastrous results can come. And unfortunately, this is what was happening in the Ephesian church. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, and the Ephesian church at large. Remember, it's to Timothy, but it's also to the church, this letter. And he is warning them in these three verses against distraction, against sin, and against changing the gospel or listening to those who do. Paul also encourages Timothy and the church of how to fight the good fight of faith. And that should bring up some pretty strong memories for you, being in Ephesians 6, the whole armor of God. But remember, Ephesians was the first letter to that church, and now we have 1 Timothy. To Timothy as he pastors the Ephesian church. So definitely some running themes. <clears throat> so let's look at this together. Let's look at verse 18 and the first little part of 19 together. <clears throat> so Paul says, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, 
that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. Let's just take that piece. We've all heard of families, certain families, passing down certain vocations to their children and over and over through the generations, whether it be a vocation or a skill or a family recipe <laughs> or a trade, right? And it's neat to see families like that, that over the generation you see that legacy, you see that heritage, that these skills or uh, reputation or recipe or trade has been passed down. It's been entrusted to the next generation. It's been guarded, preserved, protected, all of those things, right? And in a similar way, Paul says, I in charge, or I in charge, I entrust to you this charge, Timothy. So in a similar way, Timothy has been entrusted with a charge from Paul. But we know ultimately it's from God. But what is this charge? Simply put, this is Timothy's mission at the church in Ephesus. This is his mission. It wasn't simply to do a job. It was to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. To preach that Jesus is risen from the dead and he is Lord of all heaven and earth. <clears throat> it was to preach the word of God. The world desperately needs to know who God is and how he has revealed himself. So Timothy's role is to do just that. It was, so those who have believed upon Jesus and, and as Lord and Savior, those in the church at Ephesus, they desperately need to know more of who God is and how he has revealed himself in the scriptures. And those who have believed upon Jesus are also now enemies with the world, enemies with Satan, enemies with flesh, the former desires of their lives. And therefore, they need to be encouraged and reminded always of the gospel, of who Jesus is, his victory on the cross, and his resurrection. So Timothy's charge that Paul entrusts to him, this is the gospel and all that proceeds from there. <clears throat> Look what it says. It says, Timothy is entrusted with this charge by Paul to preach the gospel by certain prophecies made about him, about Timothy. This refers to Timothy's own history. Paul's telling Timothy, Look, remember back in your past when this happened. So sometime after Timothy became a Christian, God used the elders at the church, probably in Jerusalem, to prophesy that Timothy was to be a pastor and God also gave him gifts along those lines to be a pastor and the elders at the church laid their hands on Timothy and this was a formal thing <clears throat> excuse me we read about this in other parts of Paul's letters but in 1 Timothy 4 just uh, a little bit later in the letter Paul refers to this again in chapter 4, verse 11, Paul tells Timothy, Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. That's what we're doing right here and right now. And then verse 14, he says, Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy, when the council of elders laid their hands on you. So he refers to it again. So why does Paul mention the charge of the gospel and these prophecies about Timothy? The reason is he wants Timothy to remember them because that is how he's going to fight the good fight of faith. Holding faith in a good conscience. The only way Timothy can weather attacks from within all these false teachers that were trying to change the gospel fundamentally and also from outside, whatever persecution comes their way to Timothy or, or the church, the only way for Timothy to get through that is by remembering God's call on his life and the gospel itself. And the only way 
for him not to be consumed by the weight of preaching God's word, preaching the gospel. The only way to not be consumed by the pressure of those who are fighting against the gospel is to remember who is at the center of it all. This call to Timothy wasn't, hey, just remember this information. This call was to remember Jesus Christ, right? Your calling to preach comes from Him. He is in you. He's given you all things you need. Jesus Christ, Lord of heaven and earth. Two weeks ago, we talked about how Paul says, Jesus' grace overabounded for me. And the same is true for Timothy. He saved Paul. He saved Timothy. He gave unending mercy and grace to them both. And he, uh, he does to us as well. And so this passage is about Paul's charge to Timothy. But it was also a letter written to the church at Ephesus. And we know that it is also to us. Because we have the same spirit in us that helped Paul write the scripture, write the letter. So what about us here in these two verses? We aren't Timothy or Paul. (laughs) Not many of us are pastors. But God has entrusted to us the same gospel that is true now and that was true 2,000 years ago. Is that that right? Though the gates of hell rage against Jesus Christ, just turn on the news and you'll see 10 examples real quick and then turn it right back off. (laughs) Okay, though all these different things rage against the gospel and try to change it or try to put it down, the gates of hell cannot prevail against it, Jesus said. So we as the church, we've been entrusted with the gospel and with God's word. So we ought to know it. We ought to grow in our understanding of it. We we ought to be ready to defend it from within and without. Hey, God is the one who changes hearts. Yes, but the means he uses is often the church. That's what you see in scripture. And in the church, in your life, discouragement and confusion will come. That's That's a normal thing. <clears throat> but praise God, in 2 Peter 1, it says that God has granted to us all things pertaining to life and godliness, which includes the whole armor of God we read about in Ephesians 6. But be careful. At the end of this phrase we read, <clears throat> he tells Timothy to do this, holding faith and a good conscience. And I think that not only applies to Timothy, but to us as well. This was the danger. <clears throat> and at the root of those two phrases, holding faith and a good conscience, that's, all, that's not all these things you need to do for yourself and check all these boxes and make sure you're good with God. The root of those two things, I think, is humility and dependence upon God. Holding faith is not, hey, look at how strong my faith is. Holding faith is simply remembering Jesus Christ. The very next verse in verse 20, or 19 and 20, it tells us of those who have swerved from these things or counted them unimportant, holding faith and a good conscience. So we are to fight the good fight of faith, knowing that God has supplied us with all we need in salvation and in all of life. But in that fight, always remembering to be holding faith in a good conscience. Like I said, holding faith or having faith doesn't mean this vague sense of I, I, I believe, I just believe. It's specific things that you can remember about the gospel, that you should remember about the gospel. Remember where we were a couple of weeks ago. In verse 14 and 15, Paul's talking about his own life and he's saying, I thought I was serving God but I was actually blaspheming him and I was pursuing it and trying to throw in prison and kill those who knew Jesus and follow Jesus. And so if God can save me, he can save you, right? Because it's not about what you deserve. It's in spite of what you deserve. And he describes that in verses 14 and 15. He says, the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus the saying is trust, was, I can imagine him saying this to all of them, like, I want you all 
to know this. You already know this saying. It was floating around in the churches, but I want you to grab hold of it. In verse 15, he says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of who I am the foremost. When you see your sin, the tendency is to run away. The tendency is to change God's character. God would never love me. God would never show grace to me. But Paul says it's the opposite. God welcomes in sinners. And so our faith is a faith based completely on the grace and mercy of our loving Father. So when he talks about holding faith, it's, it's simply holding on to what God has already revealed Himself to be. You can bank on His character. No matter what happens to you, no matter what kind of discouraging or condemning thoughts come into your mind, you can hold on to the fact that God welcomes sinners through Jesus Christ. And that's good news. So some people <clears throat> get too wrapped up in what they're doing, whether it be art or work or sports when they're young and sometimes you can forget why you set out to do things in the first place you can kind of get wrapped up in it or lost in it and forget why you did it in the first place and that makes me think about as we walk through this life as believers we, we can't forget these basic things we can't ever forget the gospel the gospel is our home base we, all, we must always be personally and as a group, not assuming the gospel to be true, but cherishing the gospel, rehearsing the gospel, explaining the gospel, taking delight in who Jesus is, reminding ourselves, reminding others of the gospel. So holding faith is not about how strong your faith is. It's about remembering how strong God is is and how faithful God is and how strong God's promises are. <clears throat> it's remembering personally and as a church that your life and soul belong to God, belong to your gracious Master and Lord. And that's also the thought that enables you to have a good conscience before Him in all that you do. So in verse, uh, the later, latter part of verse 19 and 20, let's look at that together. Paul says, by rejecting this, by rejecting these things, right? Holding faith and a good conscience. Some have made shipwreck of their faith. Among whom are Hamanias. I kind of struggle with the pronunciation of that sometimes. And Alexander. Paul says, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So there's a lot in these two verses. But I want you to think about, if you were on a basketball team, or a similar sports team, and you had a teammate who, they started well, they were all in, and at some point they start to complain Right? They start to complain about the practices. They start to complain about having to go to the games. They start to complain about the uniform and the coach and other players. And soon the whole team is affected by that complaining. Right? Sometimes they never show up at all. And sometimes, or eventually, they start to bring down the entire team and affect the attitude of the entire team. If it gets to a certain point... The loving thing for the coach to do is to go to that player and say, look, I love you and I love that you're on this team, but your heart is not in it and you are really affecting the rest of the team with your attitude. You cannot continue with us if this is your heart and outlook and behavior. In verse 20, <clears throat> Paul says, this has happened in the church with some of the leaders who have strayed from the truth of the gospel. So from the previous verses, what happens when you're not holding faith in a good conscience before God, simply resting in the gospel? What happens when you start teaching things that are wrong? Or what happens when you continue to walk in sinfulness? 
despite your brothers and sisters in Christ lovingly rebuking you. What happens? Well, two things happen, Paul says. One thing naturally, and the other one Paul does himself. The first is the first thing that happens is their, their faith is made a shipwreck. That's what happens naturally when you deviate from the gospel. So what's going on here? The second thing that happens is that Paul actively, in his words, hands these two men over to Satan. What does that mean? Well, let's look at the first one, making, uh, making faith a shipwreck. So some have swerved from holding faith and a good conscience before God. Some have wandered from the truth of the gospel. Some have put the focus on something other than Jesus Christ. And guess what happens when you do that consistently? Your faith is made a shipwreck. If you remember the first part of the letter, Paul warns Timothy. He says, tell these men to stop focusing on myths and endless genealogies. Right? The sum and substance of their teaching, of their life, of their conversation is not the gospel. It's these little niche interests that they've made obsessions. And this is what they're feeding the church with. Stuff that can't help them. Stuff that may not even be true. So is this someone, or these two individuals here, are they, are they Christians or not? I don't know. And I don't think Paul presumes to know either. But in either case, their current desire is for sin and not for Christ. That much is clear. Paul talks about a similar shipwreck in 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, talking about those who confess Christ, but X, Y, and Z. So in 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, it says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. <laughs> so it describes it a little bit differently there, but very similar context and in the same book of a shipwreck of your faith. So these leaders, through their teaching of false doctrine or their undue emphasis on the wrong things, things that don't ultimately matter, these men have made a shipwreck of their faith. Be careful that you don't do the same thing. Just because it seems true and seems good and uses Christian language, uses Bible terms, does not mean it is true, good, and in step with the gospel. True Christian discernment is not really put to much use between Christianity and atheism. It's easy to see how atheism is false in light of Scripture. But when someone comes along and they say Jesus, they say grace, they say love, they say gospel, they say church, they say praise God and hallelujah and amen. But their gospel is ever so slightly changed. That it's truly not Jesus at the end of the day, it's Jesus plus something else. That your works, that your obedience before God plays a part in your salvation, it's deceptive. That's where discernment has to take place. So be careful you don't do the same thing. Just because it seems true and good, something that uses Christian language doesn't mean it's true and good and beautiful and in step with the gospel. So may God help us to know Jesus Christ all the more and to always be students of the Word of God. And the second thing that happens when these leaders have rejected or, or strayed away from holding faith and a good conscience, the second thing that happens is a formal action by Paul. He says that he hands them over to Satan. Again, what does this phrase mean? What if I told you it means that we, are, as the church, are to judge each other in a certain way? 
and hold each other accountable when there is unrepentant sin present. Would you believe me? Today, this is a, almost a foreign concept to churches. We talked about this in Sunday school, but there's, there's kind of two extremes that we stay in as churches. One is we're a jerk about everything, and if you're out of line with anything, we're going to tell you about it in a very legalistic way, and your salvation's dependent upon it, or you can't be a part of us. <laughs> the other extreme is we never say anything. God will work it out. They have the Holy Spirit. I have the Holy Spirit. God will work it out. Those are the two extremes, and both are ungodly. The best way to understand parts of Scripture you don't understand at the first look, like this phrase, handing over to Satan, what does that mean? Is not to guess. It's to find other parts of Scripture that shed light on the unclear parts. So, Let's do that. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 5 and let's let Scripture answer itself. Paul's dealing with a similar subject in 1 Corinthians 5. And let's see if you can pick out the similar phrases. So 1 Corinthians 5. Let me start in verse 1. Paul says to the Corinthian church, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you're arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn this? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Verse 3, For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord." Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are uh, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He returns to this subject. In verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But, I, but now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, brother in Christ, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or as an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? There's the phrase. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So, hopefully that extended section sheds light on what Paul means by deliver this, I've delivered these men over to Satan. So Paul says, when you forget the gospel, you focus obsessively on something, or you're teaching something, or living in some way that's out of step with the gospel, that you're living in something that Jesus delivered you from, and you have a, not a care in the world about it. God tells us that one of the church's callings is to lovingly say to people who are in sin and claim to be a brother in Christ. They claim Christ. You may not continue with us as a local body of believers if you continue in this sin. 
and you have no desire to stop or repent. Jesus says the same thing if you think, well, that's just Paul. Well, Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 18. If your brother sins, take it to him. If he doesn't hear you, take another person who's a witness to the thing with you and talk to him again. If he doesn't receive you, take it before the church. And if he still doesn't listen to the whole church or to people in the church, then let him be an outsider to you from that point on. Right? For two, I think this is not a good attitude to have. That, you know, if, if they are in sin or teaching something wrong, then just leave them be and eventually it'll all work out. Jesus would say no. Paul would say no. We aren't God. We can't look into someone's heart. But we can do the job that God has given us to lovingly point people to the gospel and the realities of the gospel. And that attitude of just leaving, leaving it alone, it will start to affect you. It will eat your church from the inside out. Paul says you need to be this unleavened lump, right? A little affects the whole. So the church is not a place for people who never sin, but it is the place for those who have come to be healed from the terrible heart of sin and its effects. And all of us who follow Christ, we've been saved by the cleansing blood of Christ. And we want to live for the glory of God. That's a desire that He's put in our hearts. And therefore, the church cannot look like the world. The attitude that should, should come under discipline. This is not something that, like, when you sin or you, you are terribly unwise in some area, then the, the, the church just comes and condemns you. This is a very specific attitude. The attitude that should come under discipline in any church is, I'm a believer in Jesus, I claim Him, He loves me, and I want my sin too. I have no desire to get out of it. I have no desire to repent. And more than that, it's a message of Jesus is okay or approves of my sin. That's the dangerous attitude. So that's why Paul says, I handed over these men to Satan. But we can't forget the last phrase. The last phrase is so important. He says, so they might learn not to blaspheme. Again, they were teaching something contrary to the gospel. We don't know exactly what. That makes it a little bit difficult. From other parts of the letter and other parts of the New Testament, it could have been that they were teaching the resurrection had already happened. And so people were kind of panicking, like, wait, what? Did I miss it? Right? That's in the later part of 1 Timothy. It could have been that they were adding things to the gospel, like you believe in Jesus, but then you also have to be circumcised in order to be saved. Or you can't eat certain foods, or you can't get married. So they were changing the gospel and leading people astray. Instead of, you can have freedom in Christ. It's, no, you've got to do these things, and maybe one day it'll be good enough, right? That's a different gospel. That's not good news at all. So they continued in this despite encouragements to stop. And so Paul said, I handed them over to Satan. But for a certain purpose, the purpose is so that they would learn not to do this. The purpose is restoration. It was for their good. This was not to be the final nail in the coffin. So some of us have a really hard time with this, this judgment component or this accountability component within the church. But when you read about it, it is always a mark of God's love for the church, for His people, and our love for one another. So it must always proceed from love. If it's from any other attitude, then you, my friend, need to repent. I need to repent if it's not from love. Paul says that in chapter 1, verse 5. He says, the aim of our charge is love. But we have to connect the dots here. A real and good extension 
of love for God and love for others who are in Christ because of the love that God put there in the first part, first place, a real extension of that love is calling people to account when they walk in unrepentant sin. Mutual accountability and discipline if necessary. Whether God humbles them as believers, whether they, they are out of the church and, and they're miserable and God humbles them from that point, or they come to faith in Jesus for the first time, they realize, I was deceived. I didn't know Christ, and that's why I was walking in sin. Whatever the case, the purpose is always for them to come to a place of genuine repentance. It's not this picture of we have it together and you don't. That's not the picture at all. The picture is this is the gospel and this is not. So this is God's good design. And from this text, we see that we as the church, we must be ready to hold each other accountable out of love for Christ and His truth. And from verses 10 and 11, the earlier verses, or uh, uh, 18 and 19, we also remember that like Timothy, God would have us wage the good warfare, fight the good fight of the Christian life, not by our effort putting on our uh, our boots and getting out in the trenches with just a thought to our own strength and ability, but by the truth of the gospel and not swaying from that. And that's what happened when these men swayed from that. The truth of the gospel is that you can come to know God. You can be reconciled to God. You can be free of your sin and free of the wrath that is coming because God is a good judge. Through Jesus Christ, Jesus lived a perfect life and then died in your place on the cross. And only by trusting in Him can you have life, can you escape the judgment of your sin and be placed in the kingdom of God. It's a glorious thing. You can't earn it. it you don't come by it by a prayer or the strength of your belief or even the completeness of your repentance. You are simply looking to Jesus to bring you to God and forgive every sin. And He is faithful to do that because He is perfect. And like we talked about earlier, God loves sinners. God invites sinners. He doesn't turn them away. That's the miracle of the gospel. So I invite you, if you don't know Christ, to believe upon Him. Simply believe on Him. That's it. If you haven't been baptized as a believer... I encourage you to come talk to me about that. That would be a mark of your life of joyful obedience because of who Jesus is, that you would proclaim Him to the world in front of the church. Um, if you have other prayer needs, uh, please come see me after the service. Obviously, I can't uh, lead us in song and play guitar and pray with you simultaneously. But <laughs> after the service, please let me know if there's any way that, that myself or our church can pray for you, love you, support you, encourage you any of that. Please let us know. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the gospel. Lord, we thank you that the aim of our charge, the mission you've given us, God, is love. God, we've been reconciled to you because of your love for us that we didn't deserve, that we don't deserve, that we'll never deserve. And God, that you've given us the ability to love you, to know you, and to love each other, and to know each other in an intimate way, Uh, it's just a miracle. It transcends every label or every uh, identifying factor that we as humans like to throw around. If we're in Christ, then we're family. Lord, that's, that's such an encouraging thing. And Lord, if we're family, then God, we need to be willing to hold each other accountable, encourage one another. Um, God helps to wage the good warfare of the Christian life by the truth of the gospel, uh, whether it's in parenting or, or our jobs, with family, with health, whatever, whatever it is, Lord, help us to remember the gospel and proceed from that place that Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth and we are new creations in Him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.